Hello, listeners. Jordan Crittenden here, finally coming at you with a new episode of Dark, Dark World. I know it's been ages, and I'm sorry for that. Really going to try to be a little more consistent with the releases. Uh, I just wanted to come on here at the top of the episode and tell you that I apologize for how long it's taken sometimes to get these episodes out, but I do hope that you'll bear with me, and I do hope that you'll enjoy today's episode, which covers a case that was brought to my attention by a man named Nate Bartels. Hello, Nate. Nate has gone out of his way to recommend several cases to me, and you know, we get that from time to time. People will write in and say, hey, cover this case or cover that case. But Nate gave me an extensive list, not only of, of cases that he thought I should cover, but of cases that most other podcasts haven't covered. Because, as you know, that's very important to me, trying to do stuff that's a little bit different or, you know, not so trodden over. Um, but yeah, so Nate gave me a whole list of cases that either have no podcast coverage or, or very minimal podcast coverage. So uh, that's very cool. And then in addition to that, he provided multiple sources and links uh, f for each of the cases. So it's like he's given me the research as well. So big, big, big ups for Mr. Nate Bartels. Thank you, Nate. Very cool of you. So yeah, that's how I learned about today's story, which is Certainly an interesting one. Uh, it got me to thinking a lot about high school life and just how different <laughs> I was when I was young, which I guess sounds stupid because we all change so much from who we were in high school, but it really does seem like a past life to me. And I wonder if those of you who are my age or, or older now feel the same way. Do you look back on high school like your glory days, like the Bruce Springsteen song? Were those the best times for you? I hope not. Uh, although I, I shouldn't say that. Actually, why, why hope not? If someone does feel that way, they feel that way, right? Um, high school was not the best time for me, though. I don't, I don't look back on that as like my glory days. But there were moments. There were things about that time that I do recall fondly. Anyway, that's what uh, I thought a lot about as I covered this case, and obviously you'll hear why. I'm going to stop with the rambling. I've made you wait long enough for a new narrative episode, so I'll chat again with some housekeeping stuff at the end of the show. For now, I give you today's episode. This is Dark Dark World, episode 32, The Murder of Ricky Cowles Jr. <laughs> Our story begins in 1997, which is probably no surprise to you all. I love my 90s cases. And it takes place in Lancaster, California. Lancaster is a bit north of Los Angeles, and it's more of a deserty California town, not unlike, you know, Indio, Palm Springs, Coachella Valley kind of, kind of vibes, I think, for Lancaster. And the best way to get into the story, I think, is to go into some of the central characters. We've got a group of teenage high school girls, good group of friends, and the ages of these girls vary. Um, we've got 16-year-old Amy Priestmeyer, and Amy is an honor student, she's athletic, she's... I go. I guess you would say your typical well-to-do teenage girl, 16-year-old girl. And her best friend, 18-year-old Sarah Chapin, who is a cheerleader and a beauty pageant queen 
um, popular girls. Now, that wasn't my experience in high school. Most of my friends in high school were the same age as me, or at least, you know, in the same grade level. Um, so it was unusual for us to have friends a couple of grade levels above us, you know, like the 16-year-olds hanging out with the 18-year-olds, although I understand that that's not unusual for everyone. I think it's probably because I wasn't very popular, really. Um, I mean, you know, I I was able to run with all circles. I was friendly with people in different walks of life and different social circles, but, you know, I, I wouldn't def- consider myself popular by any means, but I think when you're a cheerleader or you play on the football team or involved in student government and you're just sort of more involved in the school. Uh, I think you do tend to have a wider friend group and then the age thing isn't as prohibitive, I guess I would say. So like, you know, like the senior dudes on the football team are friends with 16 year old dudes on the football team because of the fact that they play football together and then they become friendly and the same goes with the cheerleading squads and things like that. I think that just the circle widens and the age barrier isn't quite as much of a thing. Um, Maybe I'm making too much of this. I don't know. Maybe everyone's (laughs) had a different experience, but mine was much more, uh, it was my crew of friends. We were all in the same grade. Anyway, we've got a lot to get to. I'll move on. So yeah, we've got Amy Priestmeyer and Sarah Chapin, and they're good friends, and they're living their best high school lives. And they meet a girl. She's 18 also. Her name's Jennifer Kellogg, and Jennifer is on the dance team. Now, I don't know how it was at your school, but we had cheer and we had palm. So we had the palm girls and the cheer girls, and they were very different, it seemed to me. The Palm Girls did more of the dance. It was more dance-oriented, and that's what Jennifer Kellogg was into. But again, when you're involved in these sorts of things, the lines are blurred, and everyone just kind of hangs together. So Jennifer ends up hanging out with Amy and Sarah. And as tends to happen, you've got a younger girl like Amy Priestmeyer, who is 16, and she starts hanging out with an 18-year-old who's just a little more rambunctious, a little bit more wild, you know, living on the edge because she's much closer to college age. And it's, you know, right when we're about to taste that freedom, getting out of high school, that's when I think we're at our most, not spongy, you're much spongier when you're even younger, but full of possibility, excited about finally being free, being an adult. And you tend to push that envelope a little more, maybe a little too soon. And so what I'm getting at here is Jennifer Kellogg was a partier. She was into drugs and, you know, she liked to have a good time. And so she turns Amy and Sarah on to this this life a little bit. So they're still doing their high school thing, involved in their cheer and their dance and their sports and their honors classes, but they're getting high as well. And I'm not talking anything too crazy, but, you know, smoking some pot, drinking some alcohol, some cocaine here and there, tripping on acid. You know, just a standard, standard old high school good time. Um, but yeah, so Sarah Chapin actually would later, later say that Jennifer Kellogg was, quote, the type of girl that helped you get in trouble, the type of girl your parents warned you about, end quote. So we know the type, right? We all know the type. And anyway, these girls, there's a fourth girl we need to talk about, and that's Shailen Cowles. And she was 16, same age as Amy. And she runs with this circle a little bit too, but sort of on the periphery. She's friends with them, but she's not tight with them. And Shailen would be the first to tell us that there was a reason that she stayed on the periphery. It was by design. She felt that the other girls were a little too wild, that um, they lived on the edge a little too much, to the point where she got bad vibes from them a little bit, not just because they partied, but it seemed that their rebellion was more than just sort of typical high school rebellion. They were, as she puts it, it seemed like they had an agenda. 
an agenda to be rebellious. We're not going to listen to our parents. We don't care what they say. Rules? Nah, we don't follow rules. Boundaries? There aren't any. And Shailen also observed that these girls have sort of a mean streak. They could be catty and vicious. And as I mentioned that these crowds tend to hang together and everyone gets along with everyone. Well, not entirely the case. Uh, Jennifer and Amy, well, let's say Jennifer had a mean streak and she sort of rubbed that off onto Amy and Sarah a little more than Sarah and Amy were able to rub off their nice, innocent, younger girl vibes onto Jennifer. Now, that freedom to be wild, the freedom to finally make it to adulthood, really would come into full swing in the summer of 1997. This is when Jennifer and Sarah would actually graduate from high school. Amy was not ready for that yet, but the other two, they're out. They're free. And Amy's along with them anyway, so she felt the same way, right? Finally, we're out. And we can live on our own, and we can drink, and we can bring boys over, and it doesn't matter. All that stuff, right? They finally earned it in the summer of 97. But our story begins earlier than that. We need to go back to the winter of 1996. Christmas time, 96, rolls into January 1997. So winter time at the end of 96 and beginning of 1997. And this is when Ricky Cowles Jr. comes into our story. Ricky Cowles Jr. is the 21-year-old older brother of Shay Lynn Cowles, our good girl on the periphery of the not-so-good girls. Just to say, I'm not judging these girls, not at this point anyway. I was the same way. Most of us were. So yeah, no judgment here. Totally get it. So 21-year-old Ricky Cowles Jr. enters our story, and I'm just going to call him Ricky Cowles from now on. There's a junior there, just so you know. But yeah, Ricky Cowles, 21, he enters the story as the older brother of Shay Lynn Cowles. And Shay Lynn is attending a party towards the end of 1996 in the winter when Amy Priestmeyer, 16-year-old Amy's parents go out of town. So she decides to throw a party because that's what these girls are looking to do, right? They're going to party. Mom and dad are out of town. Let's get to it. So Shay Lynn goes, you know, she's on the periphery. She's maybe not going to do the drugs and do the serious drinking, but she's going to go and hang out because that's what everyone's doing. Amy's there, obviously. It's her house party. Her parents are out of town. She's the host. And Jennifer's there, and Sarah's there, and of course Shay Lynn is there. And earlier in the night, Shay Lynn had mentioned to her older brother, Ricky, that she was going to this party. And lo and behold... 21-year-old Ricky shows up at the party of teens. We all know this guy, right? He's like the Matthew McConaughey character in Dazed and Confused, the guy that's a little too old to still be hanging with the high school kids, uh, but he does it anyway. So, yeah, we all know that guy at the party. Maybe some of us have been him once or twice. Uh, so Ricky shows up to hang out with his high school sister, and her friends at this party. And look, yeah, Ricky's an older man. He's a working man now. He works with his father, uh, an electrician. He's working on high voltage power lines like, you know, that you see along the highway. He's up in the little crow's nest working on those things. So dangerous work. Apparently you're compensated pretty well for doing dangerous work. He was making good money. Uh, just purchased a new BMW at the time, so doing quite well. Shows up to the party in his flashy car, impressing all the teens. Uh, but, you know, working man needs to unwind a little, too. Ricky liked to have a smoke and a drink, and so maybe it just, you know, didn't matter to him too much how old the clientele was. Um, oh, you know, I say Ricky it was 21, and he is at the bulk of our story, which is later in the summer of 97, which you know, is sort of what I opened with. But actually, he's 20 at this time, at the end of 96. So my bad there. He He's actually not old enough to be going to a bar just yet. So, you know, high school house party, maybe due to a lack of options, I guess you could say. We'll, we'll give him that. But he's soon to be 21. So 
still four years older than than Amy, for instance, and four years older than his sister, and a couple years older even than Jennifer and Sarah, who are soon to graduate and be 18. Now, Shaylin's friends, Amy and Sarah, you know, they thought Ricky was pretty good looking. Here's a cool older guy who's got a BMW and works and makes money. And wow, you know, they were drawn to him. Amy, in particular, and right there at the party, Amy sort of developed a bit of a crush on Ricky. And according to his sister, Shaylin, Ricky was instantly smitten with Amy as well. There at the house party, they fell for each other, and they became a couple. Amy obviously didn't mind that Ricky was older. That's pretty much what she was looking for, was to be an adult. And what better way to just get instant access to adulthood than to roll around with a guy who's got his own car? And <laughs> and Ricky also didn't mind that Amy was younger, still a sophomore in high school. No problem for Ricky. They launched into a full-on relationship. And Ricky's taking Amy out on dates on the weekends with his hard-earned electrician's pay, and they're going on trips, and he buys her gifts, and uh, yeah, nice, happy starter relationship, starter high school relationship. But the parents of these two weren't quite as smitten with the relationship or the idea of it. Ricky's parents were not thrilled when he brought Amy home to meet them, but not really for the reason that you might think. It wasn't so much to do with the fact that she was a minor and their son is living the statutory life here, but it was more to do with what Ricky's mother, Debbie, said was the fact that Amy seemed manipulative and that something seemed off with her. Debbie and Rick Sr., Ricky's father, felt that maybe Amy kind of had him whipped a little bit, pardon the phrase, but that she had him sort of wrapped around her finger and that she could get Ricky to do pretty much anything. Such was the depth of his love for the young 16-year-old. But Ricky's mom, Debbie, wasn't so noble with her disapproval either, what really seemed to bother her was that, it, you know, if Ricky ends up sort of losing interest in this relationship, could Amy then hurt him in some way? Could she press charges against him for statutory rape? Could she come after him in that sort of way? So it was more that <laughs> Ricky's parents were worried that he could get in trouble over this than it was that they disapproved of Amy in any real way. At least that's my reading of it from the sources I've looked at. And look, I mean, that's a valid fear, I guess, but it's just, I don't know, are you coming at this from a moral place or just a don't get caught son kind of place, you know? But whatever the source of her motivations, Debbie Cowles did take some steps. She took measures to try and stop this relationship. Ricky was living at home with his parents. He lived in a guest house off to the side, and his parents forbid him to have Amy stay over. She wasn't allowed to stay the night. And of course, Amy would sneak over, Ricky would try to sneak her into the guest house, and they got caught a couple of times. And Debbie Cowell said, look, son, I'm serious about this. If this continues, you're just going to have to move out. If you want to be with this girl and potentially mess your life up, then you're going to have to do it elsewhere. You're not doing it under our roof. And the reason that Debbie laid down the law like this, of course, was because she was hopeful that Ricky would choose living at home rent-free with his parents over his relationship with a 16-year-old girl that I think mom and dad didn't think was genuine. They thought he was just smitten and it was a crush and he'd get over it, but Ricky was really in love, or at least he believed he was. And so he chose moving out. He said, all right, mom, I understand. I respect your ultimatum. And I've chosen this option. I'm moving out. Love ya. See you later. And sophomore Amy Priestmeyer moved with him. Ricky got an apartment, and Amy moved in with him. So you might ask, well, where are Amy's parents in all of this? What do they think about this? She's the 16-year-old girl still in high school moving in with a now 21-year-old. So what do they think of all this? Well, I'll let you know what they thought 
after this quick break. Amy Priest Meyer's parents looked at this relationship between Amy and Ricky from a different angle. When you've already got Ricky's parents, along with many of Ricky's and Amy's peers, having a little trouble with the five-year age gap between the two lovers, you'd maybe expect 16-year-old Amy's parents to have even more of an issue with it. But that was not the case for Larry Priest Meyer, Amy's father and his wife, Georgia. Of course, part of the reason for that must be that Larry and Georgia Priestmeyer got together when they had a significant age gap as well. Georgia was just 17, while Larry was 24 when they met, so an even wider age gap. And uh, that didn't stop them. So I suppose they felt it would be hypocritical if they had any qualms about their 16-year-old dating a 21-year-old. Whether it would have been hypocritical or not, they didn't seem to have trouble with it. They just did not see what all the fuss was about. They thought Ricky was a good guy, and Amy was happy. And by the way, if you hear a squawking from time to time, I'm not sure if the mic's picking that up, but there is a quail right outside of the studio window here. It's kind of nice. We got a little family of quails out in the backyard. This is their nesting season, so they've got a clutch of eggs somewhere back there. My dogs are keen to discover where that is. They keep sniffing around, trying to figure out exactly where the clutch is. It makes for sort of entertaining mornings when I take the dogs out there and they're hunting around and the quail fly up into the tree and watch over, squawk at them. So if you're hearing that, that's what it is. If you're hearing a squawking, don't come a knocking. If you hear a squawking, don't you come a knocking. It's just a rock and roll bird. Yeah. If you hear a squawking, don't you come a knocking. It's just a rock and roll bird. Not sure why you would come a knocking, but what I meant to say was if you hear a squawking, it's a quail. Apologies. So, as you might imagine, Debbie Cowles was none too happy to find out that. Amy's parents were so okay with Ricky's and Amy's relationship. Debbie thought that maybe if she reached out to Amy's parents, that she could gain some support in trying to break up this relationship that she didn't approve of. She figured that certainly the parents of a 16-year-old girl wouldn't want this going on, but no, no, Georgia and Larry were quite on board. One day, Debbie Cowles called up Georgia Priestmeyer and said, listen, my son's trying to move your daughter into his new apartment, and I think it's an inappropriate relationship. He's too old for her. Your daughter's too young, and she should be staying home living with you. She's a high school kid, for crying out loud. And Georgia responded with, well, I'm not sure that's what's happening, actually. Uh, we don't know anything about that, but, you know, Amy can make her own decisions. And Debbie Cowles looked upon that attitude with some judgment. She felt that Amy's parents clearly had no control over Amy and were basically letting her live like an adult already. On the flip side, you've got Debbie herself acting as if her son is in high school and he's the one that needs parenting. So basically, we have 21-year-old Ricky's parents treating him like he's in high school, he's the teenager, and then you have 16-year-old Amy's parents treating her like she's the 21-year-old out living a life, having an apartment, working a job. So sort of a roles reversed thing going on there. And so it will probably come as no surprise to you that when Amy and Ricky ended up getting pregnant, it was Amy's parents who they broke the news to first. They weren't so crazy about telling Ricky's parents. However, it was here that Amy's parents drew the line. This they were not too thrilled about. Georgia and Larry thought that they had done quite a good job raising their kids to understand contraceptives and to use them, and they felt that part of the trust they had given Amy 
was under the conditions that she would live responsibly and make good choices. Come on, Georgia and Larry, she's 16. What do you think kids do? They're not always responsible and they don't always make good decisions. So maybe you do need to exercise a little bit more control, just a bit more of a parental presence in your daughter's life. There is a reason, of course, that we don't really consider kids to be adults until they hit 18, until they're beyond high school level. Nevertheless, while they were somewhat disappointed and certainly concerned about Amy and Ricky's pregnancy, Georgia and Larry Priestmeyer still trusted that their daughter was in good hands with Ricky and that Amy and Ricky were solid young people that would make good decisions and be good parents. So they were supportive. And pregnant teenage Amy found support from other sources as well. Her best friends, Jennifer and Sarah. Amy invited them to move in, which Ricky wasn't entirely thrilled about. But ultimately, because Amy's happiness was his main motivator in life at this point, he conceded and was fine with it, really. And so Ricky and Amy's apartment really became party central. This was now a place where these girls who wanted that adult sense of freedom could finally get it. Sure, Amy was pregnant, so she couldn't really party to the degree that Sarah and Jennifer wanted to, but she was still a hell of a good hostess to some of the wild ragers that started to happen over at the apartment. People were seemingly constantly in and out of the place. You had high school kids coming there, you had some older people coming in, people that knew Ricky, so you had sort of a mixed bag of ages in there. And Jennifer, this is Jennifer Kellogg, you remember she's the older one of the friends, still in high school but just about to be out, she's going to graduate soon. She had some older friends and some shadier friends, to be frank. You know, when you're at the party, you're at the kegger, or the high school house party of some kind, and then you pretty much know everyone or, or recognize most of the faces, but then those guys show up, you know those guys. The guys that no one really knows and starts going, did you invite him or do you, do you know him or who's that guy? And they just look a little dodgy and surely they've brought some less commonly seen substances to the party. You know the guys. So Jennifer is said to have been the one that brought these types around. And I don't know if Jennifer gets sort of a bad rap in this, but from all of the sources that I found about this case, and there aren't really a, a lot. Jennifer is sort of characterized as the real wild child. She's the one that, you know, egged everyone on to do more partying and hung out with the shadier types and stuff. And maybe that is true. It, it's hard to say. But it seems to me that all of these girls were engaging in the same behaviors and hanging out with the same people. So I don't know, may, maybe she did know all the shady people first. So that makes it her doing, and maybe she was the first one to ever do any drugs, so it makes it her influence. I don't know, but it just seemed interesting to me that she's characterized that way. You know, they'll say like, oh, and then Amy had her friends over, Sarah and wild Jennifer, or that crazy Jennifer. And maybe there's a deeper reason for that. Maybe it's a bit of foreshadowing. Hmm? Pregnant Amy was starting to feel a little forlorn about the fact that she wasn't really able to party as much as her friends were. Here she had been striving for so long and trying so hard to live like an adult, to finally gain the freedom to be able to make her own choices, her own decisions, to do what she wants to do. But now she's pregnant, and in her mind, she's imprisoned again. Now she's not allowed to party. And I do mean allowed because I fully believe that Amy would have been partying as hard as she wanted to had it not been for Ricky, who, now that Amy was pregnant, had started to look at life a bit differently. Sure, he was still young, only 21 years old, but Ricky understood responsibility. He understood the importance of commitment and obligations, and he understood that raising a child was serious business. He wanted Amy to understand that, too. So not only did Ricky not want Amy partying, he also didn't want her hanging out with her friends so much. Essentially, Ricky wanted to turn 16-year-old Amy into a homemaker. While Ricky was at work, he expected Amy to be home doing chores, keeping the house clean, cooking food. And this was exactly the sort of thing that Amy had been trying to get away from 
for her entire teenage life. So Amy ignored Ricky's requests. She continued to have Jennifer and Sarah over. They continued to throw parties. Amy herself did some light drinking and possibly other partying while Ricky was at work. And, of course, this became a source of tension in the relationship between Ricky and Amy. They began to fight for the first time since they had been together. But Amy needed to strike a delicate balance here. On the one hand, she didn't want to go back to her parents' house. She liked the newfound freedom. She liked being out on her own, living in her own place. But she didn't like the fact that Ricky was kind of controlling her now, too, almost acting like a parent. Amy also feared that because she was so young, if she and Ricky broke up, there was a chance that Ricky and his family would raise Amy's child. Ricky, of course, would look pretty good to the courts. Hard-working young man, good employment history, makes good money. On the other hand, you've got mom who's just a teenager, still in high school, and by all accounts, just likes to party. That's all she and her friends do, Judge. You could see how Amy might think that if they were ever to go to court over custody, the courts might side with Ricky. But at this point, these were just worries floating around in Amy's mind. Her relationship with Ricky hadn't really deteriorated to the point where they would be considering custody disputes at court. Had it? Well, as it turns out, Ricky, too, was having some doubts about his relationship with Amy. She wasn't quite turning out to be the sort of homemaker that he was hoping she could be. She continued to have parties. Her best friends were omnipresent in the apartment. To Ricky, it seemed as though they lived there. And to be fair, they pretty much did at this point. The trouble for Ricky, though, was he still hadn't told his parents that he and Amy were pregnant. And that was a conversation he wasn't exactly looking forward to having. But when it became apparent to Ricky that there was a real possibility that he and Amy would be breaking up, he knew he'd have to tell his parents about the baby. So one night, Ricky did go over to his parents' house and sat them down and had a stern talk with them, telling them everything. And as you might imagine, Debbie Cowles was pretty upset. But all in all, both parents were somewhat relieved to hear that the relationship between their son and Amy Priestmeyer was on the rocks. Remember, they weren't too keen on Ricky dating someone so young. A large part of that lack of keenness, down to the fact that it was possible that Ricky and Amy could get pregnant together, and then they'd have a mess on their hands. But the pregnancy issue would have to be put aside for now. For the Cowles family, the first order of business was ending the relationship between Ricky and Amy. The way Ricky told it, Amy wanted to get married and raise a family, Amy was the one who wanted to domesticate Ricky. And he just wasn't sure that he was ready for that yet. He was still young. He didn't want to be tied down. He thought he may have made a big mistake. When Ricky Cowles returned to his apartment after meeting with his parents, he told Amy that he needed some space, that she should go back with her parents for a while. Amy was furious. She told Ricky that she hated him, as she burst into tears and ran to call her mother. Not long after, Georgia Priestmeyer arrived at Ricky and Amy's apartment. Georgia asked Ricky if she could speak with him, and Ricky obliged. She explained to Ricky that with a pregnancy comes real responsibility, that he couldn't just end the relationship because of an argument. There were bigger concerns now that a baby was on the way. Sheepishly, Ricky agreed with Georgia, but much to Amy's chagrin, her mother agreed with Ricky about something, too. Indeed, Georgia told Amy that Sarah and Jennifer shouldn't be living at the apartment. That again, raising a baby means stepping up and taking responsibility. And that having friends around all the time, constantly partying and being disruptive, was creating an environment that simply wasn't conducive to taking responsibility. Georgia Priestmeyer told her daughter that she'd need to compromise with Ricky. Ricky was the breadwinner. It was he who needed to get up to go to work in the mornings. Amy would need to respect his space and his boundaries. So somewhat reluctantly, both Amy and Ricky agreed with Amy's mother. After Georgia left the apartment, the young couple talked, 
and decided to give their romance another shot. The next day would be Saturday, August 9th, 1997, and Ricky and his family would be headed off to Laughlin, Nevada for some R&R, a weekend of sun and gambling, whining, dining, all that good stuff. Ricky's parents had invited Amy to come with them for the weekend, and Amy had planned to go, but now Amy and Ricky thought that maybe it would be best to spend the weekend apart from each other, just to cool down and take some time to themselves to think. They could talk things out some more when Ricky returned from Laughlin on Monday. And so that night ended with mixed emotions for the couple. They weren't entirely happy with each other, but there was a sense that they could work things out, that everything would be okay. Over the weekend of August 9th, while Ricky Cowles Jr. was away with his family in Laughlin, Amy Priestmeyer and her friends, Sarah and Jennifer, spent the weekend partying at Amy and Ricky's apartment. Were they simply having a last hurrah because Amy had told Sarah and Jennifer that they'd not be allowed to stay over anymore once Ricky returned? Well, according to Shayla and Cowles, Ricky's younger sister, who also went over to the apartment to hang out and party with the girls, no. No, it didn't seem that way. To Shaylin, everything seemed like business as usual. It didn't seem to Shaylin that Amy had even mentioned to Sarah and Jennifer that they wouldn't be welcome to stay there anymore. Of course, it was hard to tell. Maybe Amy had told them and it just wasn't a big deal to them. Either way, Shaylin wasn't too fussed about it. She was more focused on trying some of the acid that Billy Hoffman was selling to people hanging out at the party. Billy wasn't just a blooming entrepreneur and LSD dealer, though. He was good friends with Jennifer. And while he didn't know Amy too well these days, they had grown up together. Billy's parents' house just down the street from the Priestmeyer's house. Now, though, Billy lived on his own, in an apartment complex, not far from Amy and Ricky's. Shaylin noticed the intimate back-and-forth whispering between Billy Hoffman and Jennifer and Amy, But of course, when you're tripping balls on acid, it's hard to tell whether a clandestine huddle-up might indicate some sort of shadiness or whether it might simply cut down the distance the bong has to travel as it's passed between rips. Besides, Shaylin didn't see Amy going for Billy Hoffman. Billy wasn't as handsome as Ricky, and he didn't have as much going for him. No, Billy Hoffman wasn't anyone her brother would have to worry about. It was Johnny Walls that Shaylin was concerned about, Johnny was Amy's ex-boyfriend, and he certainly didn't come over to the apartment when Ricky was around. He was here now, though, and Amy seemed to be all over him. She might have just kissed him, actually. Are the walls breathing? Oh, right. Acid. The partying lasted all night, and after the sun was up the next morning and the bleary-eyed teens began to shuffle out of the apartment in search of their own beds, Amy Priestmeyer handed Johnny Walls a letter she'd written for him. In fact, they had kissed that night, and now Johnny received a letter in which Amy detailed what she saw as the turmoil and uncertainty in her life, the confusion she felt about her pregnancy and her relationship with Ricky. On Monday, Ricky returned from his trip to Laughlin. He and Amy were happy to see each other. A few days apart had seemingly been good medicine for their relationship. Ricky had to work the next day, but he and Amy made plans to spend some time together after he got off, just the two of them, to talk about their relationship and to make plans for the future. August 12, 1997. As Ricky Cowles Jr. left his apartment for work on that Tuesday morning, he discovered a note from his girlfriend Amy Priestmeyer on the kitchen table. Amy had written the simple missive with a flirtatious smiley face and heart. 
She was merely letting Ricky know that she was looking forward to seeing him later that night and that she'd be home by 9 p.m., which was the time they'd loosely scheduled for their alone time and relationship talk. Later on in the afternoon, Ricky got a call from Amy. She wanted to know what time he'd be done with work. He told her he wasn't entirely sure, that he and his father now had to go over to the county fair to install some light fixtures, but he should still be home before 9 p.m. to meet her. But when Ricky Jr. and Rick Sr. were out at the county fair, Amy called again. And she was asking him again, almost impatiently, are you getting home yet? Do you know when you're going to be home? Like, she really seemed excited for their alone time. And it would be hard to fault Ricky for potentially getting pretty excited. Did Amy have something planned, some sort of romantic, sexy time? As opposed to, let's talk about us time. I don't know. As for Amy Priestmeyer, that Tuesday had been spent running around with the gals as usual. She and Jennifer drove down to Santa Monica for the day, just hanging out, doing some light shopping and eating. When they got back into town later that afternoon, they swung by the McDonald's near Amy and Ricky's apartment. Shaylin was working there at the time, and Amy and Jennifer wanted to see if she'd be off of work soon so she could go with them to Baskin Robbins for some ice cream. Shaylin did go with the girls, and they hung out for a bit. Shaylin was in the habit of going over to her brother's apartment after work most afternoons. Her McDonald's was just around the corner from the apartment complex. But Amy made it clear to Shaylin that things were changing now. Ricky and Amy's apartment wasn't going to be party central anymore. People weren't just going to be allowed to come and go as they pleased whenever they wanted. And certainly not tonight. She made it clear to Shaylin that she didn't want her coming by tonight. Tonight, she and Ricky were going to spend time together, just the two of them, and figure out their relationship goals. Shaylin found Amy's attitude adjustment to be pretty strange. It seemed so sudden, so severe, even rude. But it also wasn't quite convincing. To Shaylin, it felt insincere. But of course, Shaylin was encouraged by the news. She wanted her brother to be happy. And she wanted Amy to be happy, too. They had a baby on the way, after all. They really did need to figure some things out. Amy and Jennifer dropped Shaylin off at home a little after 5 p.m. and headed off. A couple of hours later, at around 8 p.m., Amy and Jennifer met up with Sarah and another teen named Jeff Shreves. Seems like Amy was really making the rounds, huh? making sure to get in some FaceTime with all of her besties before she'd be having her big night with Ricky. I don't know, it almost feels like Amy's addicted to her friends, you know, like as if being without them was impossible to consider even for just one night. But I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm reading too much into it. Like sometimes when you read these reports of, you know, how someone's day went, things can seem more deliberate than they really were, you know, because you're looking at a timeline of events as if they were these deliberate meetings or scheduled hangouts. But, you know, it's probably a little more easygoing than that. Like, oh, let's go over and see this person now. And, oh, hey, look, there's uh, the McDonald's. We should go visit Shaylin. And, oh, you know what? Sarah and Jeff are hanging out over here. Let's go meet up with them. It was probably more casual. But anyway, uh, just before 9 p.m., the time that Amy had told Ricky she'd be home, she and Sarah arrived at the apartment. Jeff Shreves was riding with Jennifer now, and they were on their way over too. Sarah didn't plan to stay, obviously, this was the big alone time for Amy and Ricky, but she thought she'd say hi to Ricky and see how he'd enjoyed Laughlin. And I think the reason that Jennifer and Jeff were headed over as well was because then they would take Sarah with them and leave Ricky and Amy alone. Not certain about that, but it seems logical. The front door was unlocked, and Amy and Sarah walked in. Amy went to use the downstairs bathroom and told Sarah to see if Ricky was home. Sarah called out for him, but there was no response. She checked the garage and saw that Ricky's car was there. Clearly, Ricky was home. So the girls found it strange that the apartment was completely silent. No TV sounds, no running water from the shower, most importantly, no response from Ricky when they called his name. And there weren't many lights on in the place either. 
Sarah felt a little unsettled. It felt to her like something might be wrong. But Amy didn't seem too concerned. The girls climbed the stairs, calling out for Ricky a couple of times. Still, no response. No sound at all. Only quiet and stillness. And then, as the girls entered the bedroom, horror. Ricky lay on the bedroom floor, his body a contorted lump. Blood was everywhere, a massive pool of it growing out across the floor from Ricky's head. He was in very bad shape, but he did appear to be alive. He was breathing shallowly, his body twitching occasionally. He appeared to be trying to speak. Amy became hysterical. Her screams were so loud and visceral that to this day, they are the strongest memory Sarah has of that night. Sarah also remembers being frozen with fear. While Amy ran around the room screaming and crying, Sarah stood rooted to the doorway. At this point, Jeff and Jennifer arrived at the apartment, and they ran up the stairs to see what all the screaming was about. So now you've got four people screaming and running around the apartment and the bedroom, compromising a potential crime scene. It's just chaos. Soon, though, the teens called 911, and Amy was so hysterical in her screaming and crying and hyperventilating that the operator had trouble understanding what exactly the call was about. So Sarah then took the phone from Amy, and it's at this moment that the following audio clip picks up. What's going on? Can you tell me what's happening? We just got back into the apartment, and we've been calling all night long, and we haven't been able to get a hold of her boyfriend. And we walked upstairs, and he's lying on the ground, and he's all bleeding. He's bleeding? He's not moving or anything. We just turned on the light, and we saw him. We came out there okay. and called you. Okay, hold on. I'm... doing now? He's twitching, convulsing a little, but it looks like something went through his head. Paramedics and police were dispatched to the apartment. There they discovered a man just barely holding on to life. The paramedics carried Ricky downstairs, using his bed sheet as a stretcher. Once downstairs, they laid him on the floor. He was bleeding severely from a massive wound to his head, which seemed to have been caused by a gunshot. It appeared that he had sustained other injuries as well, but because he was covered in so much blood, it was hard to tell exactly what those injuries might have been and where they might be located. As the paramedics began treating Ricky and preparing him for transport to hospital, deputies from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department attempted to interview him about what had happened. Here's a clip from that exchange as well, and I'll recap it for you after you've heard it because some of it's a little difficult to hear. Did you shoot yourself? No. Who did it? My next My next no. Who did it? My neck. My right. neck hurts. Oh. Who shot you in the head? Did you do it? So if you didn't catch all that, one of the sheriff's deputies asks Ricky, did you shoot yourself? Ricky says no. The deputy says, who did it? And then Ricky mutters something unintelligible. The deputy asks again, who did it? Ricky replies, my neck. And then one of the paramedics says, his neck hurts, that's what he's saying. The deputy asks one more time, who shot you in the head, did you do it? And then Ricky stopped responding. Sarah had called Ricky's parents and told them to come over to the apartment because something had happened to Ricky. When Debbie Cowles arrived at the apartment, she ran inside, calling out for her son. Debbie collapsed in Rick Sr.'s arms when she saw Ricky. Her wails of agony joined the chorus of screams and cries from Amy and now Sarah. Paramedics loaded Ricky into a medevac helicopter. Rick Sr. rode with his son in the helicopter to the hospital, while Debbie and the girls followed the sheriff's deputies by car. The family gathered at the hospital and paced the halls with worry and anguish as surgeons worked to save Ricky. But the bullet in Ricky's brain had caused so much damage that saving Ricky meant, at best, keeping him alive in a vegetative state. For two days, Ricky laid in a coma. Machines were doing the living for him. And on August 14th, 1997, Rick and Debbie Cowles were forced to make an unenviable decision. 
Friends and family came to the hospital to say their goodbyes to Ricky, coming to his bedside with flowers or mementos. They touched his hand or kissed his forehead and wished him well on his journey to the next phase. Debbie Cowles recalls a particular scene that she'll never be able to shake. She claims that at one point she witnessed Amy crying at Ricky's bedside, bemoaning the fact that Ricky was going to die. How could you? she asked. You promised you'd buy me a car for my birthday. Why did you have to die? Now, I'm not sure if this is true. It seems so bizarre and, frankly, unlikely. But I don't know. It's been reported in every source that I've looked at for this case, so I felt like I should include it. But, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure I'm convinced. Maybe, though. Maybe Amy was that heartless. Ricky Cowles Jr. was taken off of life support and pronounced dead on August 15, 1997. Still pregnant with Ricky's child, Amy Priesmeyer moved back home with her parents. Now her focus had to be on getting ready to have a baby and preparing to raise a child on her own. But for Rick and Debbie Cowles, and for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, the focus was on solving a murder. Ricky Cowles Jr. had been shot once in the forehead, and it was determined that the barrel of the gun had been held very close to him, somewhere between a half inch to two inches from his head. He had also been struck several times in the head with a blunt object. The damage caused indicated that the object was consistent with a claw hammer or something like it. Ricky's body showed no signs of defensive wounds, which indicated that he had probably been taken by surprise. There was very little physical evidence recovered from the crime scene at Ricky and Amy's apartment. The sheriff's department found a single shell casing for a 25 caliber semi-automatic handgun, and that was about it. Nothing had been taken from the apartment. Ricky's wallet remained on the dresser in the bedroom, still had his credit cards and ID, $60 in cash inside. There were no signs of forced entry into the apartment. And yet, while it was clearly unlikely that a robbery had been the motive for the attack, it was also difficult to come up with a reason why someone might want to kill Ricky. He didn't have any known enemies. He wasn't into drugs or gambling. He didn't have debts. There truly seemed to be no motive for the attack, which made the sheer savagery of the murder even more perplexing. Why would someone want to kill Ricky? And why kill him in such a brutal manner? The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department assigned two detectives to the case, Tom Harris and Larry Brandenburg. They started where any good investigation should, with victimology. They wanted to get a sense for Ricky's lifestyle. What was he involved in? How did he spend his time? Who did he associate with? What they uncovered was a fairly bland and benign lifestyle. Ricky spent most of his time working, and that meant that most of his time was spent with his father. On nights and weekends, he spent time with his girlfriend and her friends, as well as some friends of his own. But as far as the detectives could tell, having a few beers after work or drinking and smoking some weed occasionally was about as edgy as Ricky Cowles Jr. ever got. Weeks passed by and then months, and the detectives were running out of ideas. They had no leads. There was nothing to go on. Frustrated with the pace of the investigation, the Cowles family took matters into their own hands, setting up a reward fund and posting flyers around town that offered a cash reward for any information that might lead to the capture of their son's killer. Shay Lynn Cowles, Ricky's younger sister, went over to the Priestmeyer house to bring some of the reward flyers to Amy and her parents, and there Shay Lynn got to meet her niece for the first time. You see, after the murder, when Amy moved back with her parents, communications between the Cowles and the Priestmeyers had broken down. Amy never liked Ricky's parents to begin with, and of course, Ricky and Debbie hadn't approved of their son's relationship with Amy from day one, so there was no love lost, as they say. But it had actually gotten to the point where Debbie and Rick Sr. wondered if they might never even get a chance to meet their granddaughter. But on this day, Kaylee Lynn Cowles, born January 23, 1998, was introduced to her aunt Shaylin 
And during the visit, Shaylin called her parents and told them that she was holding their granddaughter, and they all sort of enjoyed a moment together. Shaylin and Amy sitting together with Kaylee, and Debbie and Rick listening in on the phone. And this gave the Cowles family some hope that maybe they could be in Kaylee's life after all. Surely it's what Ricky would have wanted, and Amy believed that too. So a few days later, Debbie and Rick were invited over to the Priestmeyer house, and there, illuminated by the cooing smile of their granddaughter, the Cowles and the Priestmeyers buried the hatchet. There's another phrase for you. No love lost and burying the hatchet. Meanwhile, the good times were no longer rolling for our group of teenage girlfriends. Indeed, after Ricky's murder and after Amy had moved back in with her folks, she and Jennifer and Sarah had stopped hanging out with each other as much. Eventually, they stopped talking altogether. Not actively, necessarily, like there wasn't any sort of hard line taken, like, I'm not talking to her anymore. But it was more like their friendships had just sort of faded You know, there might be an occasional phone call here or there, but beyond that, nothing, really. Detectives Harris and Brandenburg thought it might be a good idea to conduct some extensive interviews with the girls, considering that they spent more time with Ricky than just about anyone other than Ricky's father. And through these interviews, the detectives began to uncover some rumors and speculation, but even some nuggets of credible information. For instance, in an interview with Sarah... It came up that she had been spending time with Jeff Shreves on the night of Ricky's murder. You may recall Jeff was the guy who arrived at the apartment with Jennifer a little while after Amy and Sarah had arrived, which is sort of odd because before Amy and Jennifer met up with Sarah and Jeff, it had been Sarah and Jeff who were hanging out. But then it became Jeff and Jennifer who were hanging out as Amy and Sarah then rode together. So it's all very confusing and strange, Or maybe it's not at all. Again, sometimes when you look at these timelines, things seem stranger than they really are. But in fact, it's just this sort of thing that the detectives were curious about. Sarah had said that she and Jeff met up with Amy and Jennifer at around 8 p.m. The four teens then went over to the apartment of a guy named Kevin Tallwater, and his apartment was located in the same complex as Amy and Ricky's. The kids didn't go inside Kevin's apartment, but he sat with them and they all talked outside as they smoked cigarettes. Then everyone was hungry, so maybe they were smoking weed in addition to the cigarettes? Huh? Jennifer and Jeff went to Dairy Queen, while Amy and Sarah went to Burger King. Sarah told the detectives that when she and Amy were driving back to Kevin Tallwater's apartment after they got their Burger King... Sarah had suggested to Amy that they swing by and see if Ricky was home yet. Sarah recalls that Amy curtly told her no. Ricky hadn't paged her yet, and she hadn't seen any lights on in the apartment anyway, so he definitely wasn't home. Now, in talking with Jeff Shreves, the detectives learned that when Jeff and Jennifer had returned to Kevin Tallwater's after their trip to Dairy Queen, Jennifer made a phone call. And as soon as she hung up with whomever she had called, she said... Okay, we can go now. According to Jeff Shreves, as soon as Jennifer said this, Amy sprung into action. She popped up onto her feet and headed for her car. Sarah hurried to catch up with her, and Jennifer and Jeff stayed at Kevin's for a few more minutes, and then they too left to go over to Amy and Ricky's. Now, remember, Tallwater's apartment was in the same complex as Amy and Ricky's, but they're all driving from one apartment to the other. So I'm guessing that the two apartments were on opposite sides of the complex or that it was a massive complex, right? Like Either that or the kids are extremely lazy. But um, yeah, a couple of interesting nuggets there, huh? First, we have Sarah telling the detectives that Amy quickly shut down her suggestion that they go to the apartment to see if Ricky was home. And then we have Jeff Shreve saying that Jennifer made a call to someone as if to confirm something. And then when she had whatever info it was that she needed, she said, okay, we can go. To which Amy reacted emphatically and very quickly. Remember, Amy told Sarah that she knew Ricky wasn't home because he hadn't paged her. So if that's such an important indicator to her, if she was so confident that Ricky would absolutely page her if he had gotten home, but he still hadn't paged her by this point, why now was she so certain he'd be home? Who had Jennifer spoken to? Was it Ricky? 
Sarah also mentioned to the detectives that after Ricky died, Amy told her to stay away from Jennifer because Amy believed that Jennifer may have been involved with Ricky's murder, or at least knew something about it. Jeff Shreves told the detectives that a girl named Candace Orr had told him that about a week after Ricky's funeral, she ran into Amy at the local fair. You remember the fair where Ricky and his father had installed the lights. Candace Orr repeated that bizarre piece of info that I mentioned earlier. She told Jeff that Amy complained to her about Ricky dying when he did. Apparently, Amy said to Candace, First he got me pregnant, and now I can't get high or drink. And then he died before he even got me a car. Yikes. So uh, we have a lot of he said, she said kind of stuff here, right? A lot of rumor and speculation, which I suppose we might expect when we're dealing with high schoolers or, you know, just out of high schoolers. But these teens weren't the only ones yapping. You remember Billy Hoffman? He was the dude that Jennifer had brought over to the sort of last hurrah party that they'd had at Ricky and Amy's place while Ricky was in Laughlin. The guy that sold acid to Shaylin and that Shaylin thought might have had something going on with Amy, but she wasn't sure because she was tripping. Well, the day after Ricky Cowles was murdered, Billy Hoffman went to work at Kmart, as he did most days. But on this day... He happened to tell his friend and co-worker Heather that he had killed Ricky Cowles. Not only that, but he actually gave Heather a pair of bloody gloves and a claw hammer for her to hide for him. Um, uh uh-oh. It gets worse, though. Heather wasn't the only person that Billy confessed to. He told Jermaine McKnight and Robert Bobcock. He told Kyle Dunn. He told Robert Tulk. He told all of these people that he had killed Ricky. And according to these men and boys, who all quickly volunteered this information to the detectives, Billy claimed that he had killed Ricky at the behest of Ricky's girlfriend. And the reason that the detectives knew to talk to these guys to begin with was because another guy, arrested for an unrelated crime, had tried to weasel his way out of the arrest by saying that he had information about a murder. He told the officers working his case that Billy Hoffman had also confessed to him about killing Ricky. I mean, this Billy Hoffman is either a total moron or completely racked with guilt. Or both, I guess. So in April of 1998, Billy Hoffman was arrested for the murder of Ricky Cowles Jr. Billy's family got him a lawyer and they went to trial. At trial, Billy pleaded not guilty and insisted he was innocent, just as he had done when the authorities first picked him up. On the stand at his trial, he pathetically attempted to get out of it by saying that, in fact, Joey Green, the guy who had been arrested and then gave Billy up to try and get a lighter sentence, had killed Ricky. Sadly for Billy, though, the millions of people that he'd already confessed to, plus the claw hammer and bloody gloves that he'd given to his friend Heather were really all the jury needed to see through his it was Joey Green argument. It didn't take long at all for the jury to find Billy Hoffman guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Surprisingly, though, motive didn't play much of a role for the prosecution in Billy's trial. Billy, of course, had clammed up, and when he did speak, he denied everything. But for me, it's like, uh, but what about all these people who claim that Billy did this for Amy, right? They said that Billy had done it because Ricky's girlfriend wanted him to. I mean, if we believe these witnesses who are telling us that Billy said he killed Ricky, and these witnesses are compelling enough that Billy ends up convicted and sentenced to life, shouldn't we also believe the part about how Billy told them he did it for Amy? I guess not. I guess the state just wanted the killer to go down and the case to be closed and for everyone to move on. However, Billy Hoffman decided that he wasn't ready to just move on. After sitting in prison for three years thinking about his situation, he decided that it didn't seem so fair, really. So in 2002, Billy wrote a letter. It was addressed to the Cowles family. And you'll recall at this point that the Cowles and the Priest Myers have buried the hatchet 
and young Kaylee was now a toddler with both sets of grandparents in her life. Debbie Cowles, who had probably been the least fond of Amy, had developed a new respect for her. Debbie thought that Amy was a brilliant mother, and considering how young she was and all that she had been through with losing Ricky and having to raise Kaylee as a single parent, her efforts were even more impressive. But this respect and admiration was about to be destroyed, and the relationship between the Cowles and the Priestmeyers would be as damaged as it ever had been. When the Cowles family received and read Billy Hoffman's letter, they learned the truth about Ricky's murder. Billy told them that since he'd entered prison, he'd become remorseful over his actions, that he'd found God, and that he felt a moral responsibility to apologize to the Cowles and ask for their forgiveness for, quote, his part in the murder, end quote. And it was this line that stood out to Debbie Cowles. To Debbie, Billy's choice of words was important, for if Billy had a part in the murder, it may suggest that others had parts in the murder. So that's a pretty good catch by Debbie, and she wanted to know about anyone and everyone who may have had a part in her son's brutal killing. So she took Billy's letter down to the DA's office and kick-started yet another investigation. Detectives Harris and Brandenburg were back on the case, and they went to speak with Billy Hoffman, who was now willing to sit down for a tape-recorded interview in which he would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help him, newly found God. Here's a small clip from that interview. We're on tape now. The time is 1,400 hours. The date is September the 12th, 2002. Okay, you were convicted of murdering a Richard Powell? Yes. Why don't you tell me from the beginning how that thing happened? I can't remember exact days or anything like that, but uh, I'd say a couple weeks before the murder happened, I was at my house and, and Jennifer Kellogg asked me if I would kill somebody. And I said, yes, I would. Amy Priestmeyer took me to the apartment uh, and showed me how the layout was. Amy Priestmeyer. Now, Amy is was Kamala's boyfriend, the mother of his kid. Okay. She had also knew about us? Yes. Just as he told some of the people that he'd confessed to before he was arrested, Billy Hoffman now told the detectives that he had, in fact, killed Ricky Cowles because Jennifer Kellogg asked him to do it because Amy Priestmeyer wanted Ricky dead. And shockingly, that's all it took for Billy. He wasn't even paid to do it. Apparently, Billy fancied himself as a bit of a badass, a tough guy, and he felt that killing someone would elevate his street reputation. That, and according to most accounts, he was probably sweet on Jennifer. Billy went on to tell the detectives about how when she was showing him the layout of the apartment, Amy had given him a photo of Ricky and told him to hide in the bedroom where he could peek through the door and see Ricky coming up the stairs. On the day of the murder, Amy and Jennifer picked Billy up at his apartment and drove him over to Amy and Ricky's apartment. The girls let Billy inside and then left him there, where he sat in the bedroom with a gun, a buck knife, a claw hammer, and a thick pillow to use as a silencer for the gun. He waited for Ricky Cowles to come home from work. As you may recall, though, Ricky's workday ended up being longer than he'd originally planned because he and his father were called out to the fair to set up the lights. Billy grew tired of waiting. He got bored and a little anxious and started to have second thoughts. Eventually, Billy was so fed up he decided to leave, and he was halfway finished with his walk home when he was spotted by Amy and Jennifer, who drove up to him and accosted him, demanding to know what he was doing. And Billy explained to them, look, I, I can't just wait around all day. 
But Amy told him that, no, no, I've been calling Ricky and I finally got a hold of him. He just, he had to work late, but he'll definitely be back before nine. So just go back and wait. So annoyed, Billy reluctantly went back to the apartment and sat there behind the door in the bedroom, his weaponry laid out before him and waited for Ricky's arrival. Ricky showed up a little before nine. He came up the stairs, entered the bedroom, and headed for the master bathroom. But before he could get there, Billy Hoffman attacked him from behind, striking him in the back of the head with the claw hammer. But the blow didn't knock Ricky out. He turned and tried to fight back. He ran at Billy, and in a panic, Billy shot Ricky in the forehead at close range. Ricky fell to the floor, but was clearly still alive, so Billy struck him again with the hammer. In his haste and panic, Billy hadn't used his pillow silencer, and he was afraid people heard the gunshot. He quickly but calmly packed up his things and headed out of the apartment. He made the short walk back to his house and paged Jennifer when he got there. And when Jennifer called him, he told her that the job was done. So this was the phone call that Jeff Shreves remembered when Jennifer hung up the phone and said, Okay, we can go. This was why Amy had shut down Sarah's suggestion to go to the apartment and see if Ricky was home. This was why Amy had told Shaylin not to come over to the apartment, as she often did. Billy Hoffman's confession was explosive, but the detectives knew that they needed more than the words of a jailhouse snitch who'd already changed his story once. They needed to do some further investigation, and this would take some time. Interestingly, the Cowles family were kept in the loop about all of this. Remember, it was they that brought the letter to the DA and kickstarted this whole second phase of the case. So, well, the detectives spent a couple more months pursuing various lines of inquiry. The Cowles had to put on a show for Amy, pretending that nothing had changed. Every time they met up with her to take Kaylee for a couple of days or for a couple of hours to give Amy a break. Imagine that. You know, it's impressive that Debbie and Rick are just able to put their granddaughter before what surely must have been the boiling rage that they felt for their granddaughter's mother. But they did. They wanted Kaylee to be okay, to remain safe and happy, while law enforcement was working the case of her father's murder. Fast forward to 2005. With Kaylee now seven years old, Amy Priestmeyer was getting ready for a wedding. She was with a new man now, and they had been engaged for some time. But a couple of months before Amy's wedding, the Cowles received the call that an arrest was imminent. Law enforcement had finished their investigation and were ready to move on Amy and Jennifer. Debbie and Rick then contacted a lawyer and went to family court in an attempt to gain custody of Kaylee. The family court judge did grant temporary custody, but of course this kicked off a long and messy court battle between the Cowles and the Priestmeyers that would last for nearly five more years. Then Jennifer Kellogg and Amy Priestmeyer were arrested and charged with murder. After a relatively quick trial, a jury of her peers found Amy Priestmeyer guilty of murdering her boyfriend. At her sentencing, the judge reprimanded Amy's parents, saying, quote, There was a total breakdown of parenting, of moral leadership, of any kind of sense of moral responsibility. End quote. This, of course, helped the Cowles family tremendously in their battle for custody of little Kaylee. Kaylee's mother, Amy, was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Jennifer Kellogg benefited from the court's lack of interest in having another trial. She took a deal, pleading guilty to manslaughter and conspiracy to solicit murder, which earned her 15 years and four months in prison. After spending 18 years in prison, Billy Hoffman asked for clemency. In his petition, he discussed his stupidity for his role in the murder, mentioning that he was young and dumb and often on drugs, and that since then, he'd come a long way confessing to his crime, asking the Cowles for forgiveness, and offering up Amy and Jennifer to provide closure for all concerned. 
And Jerry Brown, then governor of California, bought it. He reduced Billy's sentence to 25 to life, and two years later, Billy was paroled. The Priest Myers and the Cowles did eventually come to an agreement. They decided to leave the past behind them as best they could. It was clear that both sets of grandparents just loved Kaylee and wanted her to be as happy as possible. So the families now share custody of Kaylee, who really ends up being the only good thing to come from this whole mess of a story. The most baffling part of this case to me is just the total lack of a real motive. Like, everyone involved just has these flimsy morals and (laughs) motives, like Billy seemingly just to impress Jennifer and because he thought murder was cool or something. And Amy and Jennifer had no other reason than what? So they could keep having parties at the apartment? It's just so vapid and sad. But look, I mean, Ricky Cowles wasn't exactly the perfect guy. And I actually did want to mention this, that I find it kind of odd that most of the coverage of this case seems to paint him as this sort of noble, hardworking guy whose life was so senselessly taken from him. And it was senselessly taken from him. But Let's remember also that he was a 21-year-old hardworking man who was dating and impregnating a 16-year-old high school student. So, eh, not the best look, right? I mean, I'm not victim-blaming or any of that. I don't think he was a monster that deserved to die. Uh, I just think it's worth reminding ourselves that he had some flaws, too. Sometimes I feel like once someone becomes a victim they're suddenly absolved of any of their sins. And I don't like it. I don't like that. So, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there, gang. I hope you enjoyed the story. Shout out again to Mr. Nate Bartels for recommending this story to me. Thank you, Nate. I appreciate it. I enjoyed getting into this one. No real housekeeping for me this week. Just want to let you guys know that I am trying to get back to releasing content more regularly. I've got a couple of videos lined up for the YouTube channel. And as I've mentioned, my father and I will be doing a Doc Doc World episode on Netflix's Bad Vegan. That's what's coming out next for us. So if you haven't watched that one yet, maybe check it out so you can enjoy our discussion on it all the better. Um, I'm going to try to get the Edman back on soon. I know a lot of you miss the Edman, so we'll see if we can get him back in the pipeline. And what else? The merch store. Check out the merch store. You guys had been asking for the merch. Well, now you've got it. I know I don't mention it often enough, but we've got so many cool designs up over there. So do check it out. If you haven't yet, you just go to the website, darkdarkworld.com. And click on Buy Things. Or, you know, it's always in the the show notes. There's a link to the store. Um, But yeah, really cool stuff over there. Uh, I've got multiple shirts myself. So, uh, yeah. Shout out to Miss Cinemina, who designed pretty much everything we've got over there now. But, um, yeah, awesome stuff. I'm rambling. I think that's it for now, gang. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling people about the show. Thanks for writing us reviews. I appreciate each and every one of you. For Dark Dark World, I'm Jordan Crittenden. See you.